Namaste Vancha kalpa tu vesha kripa sindhu bhai vacha aditanam bhavane bhyo vaishnave bhyo namaho namaha shri krishna jaitanya prabhu nityananda shri adhaita gadadara shivasari gaura bhakta vrinda hare krishna <coughs> krishna krishna hare 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 rama hare rama So, Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu has given the seven benedictions. What seven main benedictions? There's unlimited benedictions because the name is unlimited, like Krishna, and Krishna is not different than his name. So there is unlimited benedictions and unlimited mercy. But seven are mentioned. So he wants to make a point. These Try to remember one thing if you can. These verses are systematic and progressive. One point leads to another, to the other, to the other. And as you're going higher and higher into the mood of bhakti, you come to the conclusion which is Krishna Prem. So in this, after giving, all the mercy is there. He says, Nam nam akari bahudan yuzasarva shaktis tatar pitani amitas marane nakalaha etad sri tava kripa bhagavan mamapi dordhai vamidri samiha jani vanuragaha. No rules, no regulations. Nidja Sarva Shakti means all of the energies, qualities, forms, pastimes, names. The entire absolute truth is invested in the holy name of Krishna. And there's, one can chant anytime, anywhere, any place. But after exhausting all of the mercy that is available in the holy name, and Lord Chaitanya ends Durdaiva. <laughs> Durdaiva mehajani nahanu. And the word Durdaiva means unfortunate. But it has a second meaning, which I'll explain as the class goes on. Um, so the, everything is there. And Krishna has two categories of names. The word Bahu. And Nam Nam Bahu. Nam Nam. Yeah, Bahu. Bahu means two names, or two categories of names. He has principal names, and he has secondary names. Principal names refer to his names, in relationship to his activities, pastimes, qualities, forms. The secondary names are his energies that carry out the affairs in both the material and the spiritual world. So, for example, the prim primary names are Gopinath, Govinda, Gopijanavalabha. Give me another one. One more name of Krishna. Giridari. What else? Sham Sundar. Yeah, beautiful. So these are principal names. And these names are recommended to be chanted, along with the Krishna name, of course, which is the principal of all names because it gives you the complete understanding of the Absolute Truth, that the Absolute Truth is all-attractive. <laughs> and how, this is how he's all-attracted in his different manifestations of his names. And these names are both beautiful, full of transcendental potency, and available to be chanted by those who are engaged in kirtan. And the secondary names are Param, Paramatma, Parmeshwara, Ishwara, Brahman, Brahman. These are the names that are used to carry out Yogeshwara. 
We don't chant those names. And nor does Krishna get really excited when we do. <laughs> he doesn't really respond to those. Because they're man manifestations of his energies which are really to carry out the functions of the creation in different ways. So therefore it's recommended we chant the principal's names. And like the verse says, like Krishna or Govinda, like that. So these are the, the emphasis on that. And then as it goes on to describe in this particular section, it says that, that the name is more merciful than Krishna. Now, if Krishna is the name, and the name is more merciful than Krishna, then how can we understand that? It's understood in this way, that if you commit an offense to Krishna, then the only way you can get free from the reactions of that offense is to chant his name. If you say, my dear Lord, I've committed an offense to you, please forgive me, not enough. <laughs> you need to actually take shelter of his more merciful aspect of himself, which is the holy name. So Rupa, Rupa Goswami explains that when he says, uh, when he describes that Nama Chintamani Krishna Chaitanya Rasa Vigra Purnya Sudya Nitya Mukta Abhinna Tom Nami Nami No Nami and Nama Nami is he whose name and Nama is the name So he who is name is not as merciful as Nam So there's something greater than Krishna That's called his name <laughs> So we when you think about it, is there something that could be possibly greater than Krishna? Yes, the name. And that is, more, he's more, his mercy is fully invested in the chanting of his holy name. So devotees take shelter of the name to get the supreme and full mercy of the Lord. <laughs> and then, of course, it is mentioned in the uh, Srimad Bhagavatam. What is the last verse in the Srimad Bhagavatam? Anybody know? No, no, no. The last verse in Srimad Bhagavad, the 13th chapter, 12th, uh, 12th canto, 13th chapter, verse number 23 is... Anybody know that verse? Mm -hmm. I'll read it for you. This is the last verse in the entire Bhagavatam. So when you want to really sum up what is being said prior, you end in a, in a way that emphasizes that. So in this particular verse, it says, it goes, hmm, what is it? I had it written here and I lost it, like usual. Yes, yes, sir, but, oh, go ahead, you read it. Namasankirtanam yasya, sarva papa pranashanam, Pranamo Dukkha sama, Samanas Tamamami Harim Haram Translation <laughs> I offer my respectful obeisances unto the Supreme Lord Hari The congregation of chanting of whose holy name destroys all simple reactions and the offering of obeisances unto whom relieves all material suffering So Bhagavatam, after describing not ten different subjects concluding with the Asraya or the supreme subject which is Krishna the supreme shelter of all of the other subjects, it ends by summing up everything by everything is there in Harinam Sankarna. <laughs> so, and Bhagavatam was not written, what we say, or was written, actually, put down in writing at the beginning of this age by Vyasadeva. But Bhagavatam is eternal. So then knowledge is, is just being brought to us at a certain time period, because Bhagavatam gives this knowledge on, in the eternal way, so it's always there, it's been there, it's in the higher planets, it's anywhere throughout, and of course it's coming from the spiritual world. Because Bhagavatam is the manifestation of Krishna in transcendental sound vibration, literary sound vibration. 
So that gives you an understanding how powerful and how in exclusive the holy name is compared to everything else, and particular kirtan. Uh, japa is there. We explained the, the connection between japa and kirtan this morning to some degree, and I won't go into that again, but kirtan is the Yuga Dharma, Nama Sankirtan. Uh, what is that verse? Krishna Varna Tusa Krishna Sangopanga Saparshadam Yagyai Sankirtanai Prayai Yajanti Hi Sumedasaha. So the word Sumedasa, Medasa means intelligence, and Su means great. And there's another word, Alpa Medasa. Alpa means meager, and Prabhupada says, mind filled with cow dung. Hare Krishna. <laughs> that means those who really don't have much intelligence, can't understand, or not, don't, don't want to understand that here is the perfection of all spiritual practices, Nam Sankirtan. And those who have good intelligence take it up and make it their life and soul, actually. Okay, so now, everything is there. The mercy is there. Nija Sarva Shaktis, all of the energies, everything is there, the name is there, no rules, no regulations, no restrictions, chant anytime, anywhere, any place. What is your qualification? You have to have two ears and a tongue, that's it. That's most of us have been given the qualification. Some of us don't know how to use them, but that's another thing. <laughs> so, and then he says Dordaivam. So, I mentioned Dordaiva means unfortunate, but it has another meaning which is more to the exact understanding of the word. It means I commit offenses. I commit offenses. And because I commit offenses, I can't taste or even be attracted to chanting the holy names of the Lord. And then, Bhaktivinoda Thakur very carefully delineates what are those offenses in his discussions in Harinam Chintamani, which is actually the words of Srila Haridas Thakur, and extrapolated, or you may say broadened by Srila Bhaktivinoda Thakur in Harinam Chintamani. And he mentions that there are four categories of offenses. Offenses to the Lord, his deity form, Offenses to the name, every day we chant, in, in most temples, we chant the 10 offenses to the holy name. And well, sometimes we add the 11th fence, and I'll explain that one too in relationship to the other 10. So these 10 offenses are things that must be avoided. <laughs> To know them and to, um, without going into the ten offenses, I'm sure all of us know those ten offenses. And the eleventh offense is inattention. Inattention. And then it's called pramada. Pramada means madness. <laughs> you're calling God, but you're not really, not really. Uh, responding to his, in other words, you're chanting or you're hearing, but you're not actually reciprocating what you actually hear. It's like someone calls you and you're not there. You ever get on the phone sometimes, you're on the phone with somebody and you're talking, but they're talking to somebody in the area where they are. And you know they're not with you. And every once in a while I say, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then they, they go back to their friend, you know. <laughs> They're not interested in talking to you. But somehow you're on there. So that's like when we chant the holy name, we call Krishna, well, we should be responsive to hear that call because that hearing is the connection with Krishna. The hearing is the connection. The calling is the way to bring about that connection. But the, the what we say, the confirmation or the final part is to hear. And so, 
that's one of the offenses is to be inattention in the process of now Bhaktivinoda Thakur explains there's three kinds of inattention Vikshepa, Adakshina and Jadya. Vikshepa means your mind's going everywhere thinking about you know we're here in Italy and they got so many nice Italian prasadam and I didn't get any yet <laughs> so that's one type of inattention <laughs> Of course, that's not so bad, but <laughs> in other words, you're in it, you could go anywhere. <laughs> that's called big shape. In other words, the mind, the, you're, you're sounding the name, but you're not with the name. You're somewhere else. So Krishna says, wherever and whenever the mind wanders due to its unsteady and flickering nature, bring it under the control of the self. Bring it back to the sound vibration. And that has to be done. Otherwise, this offense will lead to other offenses. And Bhaktivinoda Thakur explains that, that the ten offenses are avoided if we chant attentively. In other words, the tendency to commit the ten offenses is minimized, reduced, and what we say, wiped out, or completely nullified simply by attentive chanting. That's how powerful attentive. That's why Bhaktivinoda Thakur says, if you want to make advancement in Krishna consciousness, you're asking me where to put your attention, put it there. Attentive chanting. Put it there. And then you'll see the results. <laughs> you'll experience the results. You'll actually connect with Krishna through that sound vibration. And when you do, there's an experience. That experience is something that you, we don't describe, we only experience. <laughs> and so we have to avoid these ten offenses, and especially the last one. Of course, Vikshepa, and then there's Aldakshina. Aldakshina means Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Hare 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 Hare. Oh, I got this message again. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, So the, the guy, he dies, and uh, no, it's not giddy, 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 that, that's not a kitty, 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 kitty. That, that, that. <laughs> you, you, you listen to some japa, they say, wow, what language is that? <laughs> I'm not sure what it is. <laughs> but, well, sometimes we do an experiment, they say, put a tape recorder or some recording advice next to you and chant, and then play it back. You wonder, who's that? <laughs> Is that me? <laughs> so we should do that. It helps to fine tune or bring our job up to a more qualified form of attention. Well, there's one, there's one, zing, 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 And then the guy dies, <laughs> and he wakes up in this land, and he sees two guys, and he says, who are you? He said, I'm Zing, and this is Rung. <laughs> You've been chanting our name. <laughs> so, <laughs> try to avoid that. And Prabhupada talks about that in the in the Chaitanya Charitamrita, he, he, he actually does the same thing I'm doing. <laughs> he, he, came, he kind of mimics how we don't chant properly. And he also explains it in writing that we should very carefully sound the name. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama. And clear chanting will help to avoid this laziness that comes by way of chanting. Because the laziness is due to not really hearing properly, and when the sound is not clear, the mind cannot catch the sound. When the, mind, when the sound is clear, then the mind is more able to connect with that sound and ultimately become absorbed in the sound. So one of the things is, don't be in a hurry when you're chanting Java. Chant nicely. You'll see, even if you slow down, you think, oh, I'm going too slow. But if you chant clearly, you'll experience something really wonderful. 
if you practice that day after day, it becomes part of you, and then the, then chanting really becomes really, really nice, real sweet. Because clarity and pronunciation are really essential in really in practicing chanting, even in even in kirtan also. And then the last one is jadya. This is another form of inattention. That means if you're too sleepy and you're chanting and you're kind of nodding out, and we call it dive bomber or jump into it. I mean, I, this is not an exaggeration. <laughs> this is what I see sometimes. I think I was. In, I started off like that too. <laughs> Hopefully, I'm not doing it anymore. But yeah, it's like that, <laughs> right, Ramchandra? You know about that one. <laughs> Hare Krishna. <laughs> he, he watches all of the devotees here. <laughs> so yeah, we have to avoid these three forms of inattention. And Bhakti Vinoda course says, if you feel sleepy then uh, get up and walk. Now walking is an extra difficulty that you have to, you can take on where you have to maneuver in such a way as that you don't crash into walls or trip or do. Um, because if you go into ecstasy while chanting, you never know what's going to happen. <laughs> you could be falling on the ground. So walking is really something that we can do, and it's recommended, but better to sit and concentrate. And that way you can put more attention and more effort and more concentration in the sound and avoid all of the extra things that come by way of trying to walk, the maneuvering this way and that way. But if you're too sleepy, Bhakti Vinoda says, do that. But then he goes on to say that if you're really unable to stay awake, stop chanting, rest. When you're, when you're clear and your mind is rested, then chant. Don't waste time trying to fight it to a point where you can't. So these are just ways of inattention that how it can manifest. So that's a form, that's, that's offenses to the name. Offenses to the deity, without going into the details, are mentioned in the Nectar of Devotion. There are many offenses. And it's not just for those who, who are on the altar. It means anyone who's in the temple, you can commit an offense to the deity. Simply by not acting properly, sitting wrongly, speaking loudly, wearing the wrong kind of clothes that are not presentable in front of the deity, you know, like jeans with slashed <laughs> knee cuts. I mean, I mean, non-devotees come into the temple fine, but not devotees. You know. Devotees should always wear nice, clean, devotional clothing when they're before the deities. That's very important. And it also is, uh, it illustrates what we stand for. Uh, ordinary clothes can be worn any time, but for those who are initiated, and I use that point, they should always wear devotional clothes because it gives a message to others. And if you're in front of the deities, these other clothes are really hard to keep clean. But a nice clean, you can always wash your dhoti, it's easy to keep clean, or your sari. Women look so beautiful in saris. That's actually one of the qualities of the, the feminine beauty is the colorful sari, or the beautiful sari. It's attractive. And you don't have to sit there in front of Krishna and put all kinds of makeup on and think that he's going to really be attracted to your makeup. <laughs> I was in Nuvrindavan and the girls used to do that. And they, and they used to get all you know, decked out with all of this stuff. you know. And then the point came up, you know, Krishna is not looking so much <laughs> at that external beauty, but he sees the internal beauty, which is you, the soul. But still, you should be clean and presentable like that. Not try to impress Krishna by your external, but everything should be clean and neat according to the proper etiquette. And otherwise, we can commit offenses in the temple, although 
we are not doing anything directly connected with the deity. So these are two kinds of fences. Now the third is what I'll illustrate, offenses to Vaishnavas. And this is, this is called, uh, you know, Hasti Aparad. It's the most dangerous form of offenses. And it really cripples our Krishna consciousness. It really makes chanting difficult. One of my dear God sisters was very advanced in Krishna consciousness. She's a preacher, she's a world traveler. She was explaining this. She said, one day when I sat down to do my japa, I noticed that I couldn't chant properly. And I was struggling, and it was something that doesn't normally happen to me as she was explaining it. And then she said, I must have committed an offense to a Vaishnava. But she said, I couldn't remember committing any, so she prayed. My dear Lord, if I've committed an offense to any Vaishnava, I apologize, and please make it known to me so I can apologize to the person. So the next day she gets a phone call from one of her friends and says, you know, this lady, she's really angry with you because you, you, treated, you mistreated her, her son. This lady was a teacher, so she was a little heavy on this boy, and it didn't work. It, was, it had the opposite effect. And so, then she called up the lady, apologized for the offense, and then she said, then my chanting was nice again. So, sometimes we don't know when we commit offenses to Vaishnavas. So here, Bhaktivinoda Thakur, he gives Six ways you can offend a Vaishnava. And this is mentioned in one of his works. He says, there are six ways to offend, to offend a Vaishnava. The first one is to kill a Vaishnava. Sometimes we feel like that, but don't do it. <laughs> no, we don't feel like that. <laughs> huh? You can't apologize after you kill him, it's too late. <laughs> so the first one is to kill a Vaishnava. The, first, the second one is to blaspheme a Vaishnava. So what is the difference between criticism and criticism that comes in the form of blasphemy? Question. You can think about that. Blasphemy means you have so many good qualities, but I look for something negative, I find something or I create something, either one, and then I make that my understanding of you and I also broadcast it. Example, when Lord Shiva was in the Daksha Yagya, Daksha came in and Lord Shiva was in meditation. Everybody rose as soon as Daksha came in because he had such shakti by simply by his presence, everyone welcomed him and they immediately rose up. It was like natural, except Lord Shiva. Now Lord Shiva was absorbed in his meditation and he didn't even notice Daksha coming in. Daksha was offended and he started to criticize Lord Shiva. Now, Lord Shiva is Mahadev. He's not just Dev, he's Mahadev. He is the best of all Devas. He's even more powerful than Lord Brahma. Brahma has 78% of the qualities of Krishna. Shiva has 84. <laughs> Shiva is very powerful. And he was an absorber, he was meditating on, on the Supreme Lord. He worshiped Sri Ram. Brahma Bole Chatter Mukhe Krishna Krishna Hare Hare Mahadeva Pancha Mukhe Rama Rama Hare Hare Pancha Mukhe means he's also seen with five heads and he chants the name of Ram. He also worships Vishnu as you read from the Srimad Bhagavatam, the fourth canto. He glorifies Lord Shishu, but he is absorbed in Ramlila. 
And, and so he didn't notice Daksha. And Daksha became uh, upset and started finding fault with Shiva so many ways. He criticized him for, you know, associating with low-class people, but that's his preaching. He criticized him for wearing snakes, having crematory ashes on his body, and so many things. In other words, he was just looking for fall after fall. But Shiva is, he's a great personality. He's without faults. What looks like faults is just something that is his particular character, that's all. And it's glorifiable. And so that's an example of a great personality and someone finds a fault in that personality and makes that fault their character description. That's blasphemy. Criticizing means when somebody does something and you don't like it, you find some fault and you criticize. That's also an offense, but it's not as offensive as blasphemy. Blasphemy is the ultimate form of criticism. So that's the second form. The next one is to become angry, to become envious at a Vaishnava. To become envious. Envy, what does envy mean? I don't like what you have, or I want what you have, or you don't deserve to have what you have. <laughs> These are simply mind thoughts like that, envy. In other words, when someone else maybe is eulogized, glorified, given some esteem and some position, you feel unhappy. But it's the opposite. Vaishnavas, when they see someone successful or getting some benefit, they feel happy. That's a Vaishnava. But those who are still contaminated by that, that lower mode feel unhappy. So that's envy. So avoid that. How do you avoid that? How do you avoid envy? Well, one, there's a couple reasons, a couple ways you can avoid envy. One is to be satisfied in yourself. Whatever Krishna has given me, wonderful. That's fine. I'm happy, I'm satisfied. If he gives me more, that's nice. If he takes something away, because I'm his devotee, I'm happy. I don't look outside or feel unhappy about someone else's success, nor do I feel unhappy about my own success or lack of success. And that's another side of envy. It's called jealousy. Same word, but a slightly different meaning. Jealousy means unhappy about yourself. Oh, I'm so low, I'm so fallen, I can't do anything like that. I, therefore, I won't do anything. <laughs> that, but that's not you, that's your shadow. When you criticize someone, you're criticizing their shadow because that's not them. They, they are a pure spirit soul. What you're seeing is the shadow of the person and you're finding fault with the shadow. Therefore, really, fault finding has no value at all. Because ultimately, the soul is pure. We're finding fault with the mind, the body, and the person who is something, as we describe it, or as we see it, somebody material. Therefore, the whole thing is, what we say, misunder, misapplied or misunderstood. And another way to get free from envy is to serve devotees. The more you serve the devotees, the more you'll be happy in the association of devotees, and the more you won't feel any slack or lack in your own. Because to serve the devotees means to serve the Lord in the most beneficial way. There's so many ways to serve the Lord, but the highest the way to serve the Lord is to serve those who are dear to the Lord. That's higher than serving the Lord himself. Higher in the sense that the Lord values that service more than he values service to himself. So when we serve the Vaishnavas, we're actually pleasing the Lord. And we also get beyond this idea of finding fault in envy. And the last one, and this is an interesting thing, 
If you're feeling envy towards someone, that means you don't like what Krishna gave that person. Therefore, your problem is not with the person, but with Krishna. Krishna has made that person who they are, and if you don't like what he gave, he gave them, then you should tell Krishna, hey, you made a mistake. <laughs> so if you think about it from that perspective, then you realize it doesn't make sense because God doesn't make mistakes. So that's another way to look at it from that end. So that's the sort of Kela Vaishnav, the blaspheme, to become envious. That's three. The next one is to become angry at a Vaishnava. And that happens sometimes. But try to avoid that. When you feel that anger coming up, Check it and deal with the situation free from anger rather than using anger as a means for expression. Because anger causes one to lose intelligence. And as soon as we lose intelligence, we say things or do things that we really don't mean. And we regret it, usually we regret it afterwards. So I'll try to avoid anger as much as possible. There's three ways you can use anger. Bhakti Siddhanta says three ways. One, towards your own laziness. He says, if you see yourself becoming lazy, get angry at yourself for being lazy. The other one, he says, to get to be angry towards your relatives who stop, try to stop you in Krishna consciousness. Adibha. <laughs> And the third one is probably, Kvakti Siddhanta says, you can become angry at the demons for causing so much havoc in the world. So these are the three authorized forms of anger. Okay, and then we go on. The next one is to fail to honor a, a Vaishnava. In other words, when a Vaishnava comes in, we just ignore him or don't, we don't think it's so important like that. In other words, to fail to honor a Vaishnava. And that's an offense by neglect. And then the last one is to not feel happy when you see a Vaishnava. Whoa. That's the least, and the most least severe of all offenses. Sometimes we see other devotees and we just don't feel happy. So what can you do when you notice that you're feeling unhappy or not happy when you see a Vaishnava? There's only one solution. You pay obeisances. That's all. You pay obeisances, there's no offense. <laughs> That's the least. But these are the six ways that one can ultimately fail, uh, you know, uh, commit offenses. Uh, Bhaktivinoda Thakur, actually he quotes Sukadev Goswami, he says he, he adds a seventh way, that's to hear criticism of a Vaishnava. If you hear somebody speaking bad about a Vaishnava and you listen in a sympathetic way, you're also going to be somewhat affected by that and also you get a reaction like that. So avoid hearing criticism of Vaishnava. Sri Raghunath Bhakta Goswami and also it was Raghunath Bhakta Goswami. If anyone would speak negative about a Vaishnava, he would immediately start glorifying that same Vaishnava, speaking about their good qualities. And if you can't find any good qualities in the Vaishnava, you can find one, he's a Vaishnava. In other words, he's dedicated in his life at least to the process of pure devotional service. That is an amazing quality in itself. Therefore, anyone who comes to Krishna consciousness in one sense is glorious. And then he mentions an eighth, 
not to leave a place when you hear criticism or not to respond to that criticism by trying to defeat the criticism. So either way, you can leave or you can try to overshadow that criticism with positive glorification of that person. And there's another alternative that we don't recommend. It says, if you can't do either one, then you kill yourself. But then you might be a Brahmin, so if you kill yourself and you're a Brahmin, then you get Brahmahatya. <laughs> so that's not recommended. So these, these are, when we say, eight different ways that one can somehow fall into a situation where we are acting outside. The word uh, offense is aparad, A-P-A-R-A-D-H-A. -A -A. That means APA means against Radha. Aparada, Aparada, Radha, against Radha. Radha represents pure devotional service. So even in the word we can find uh, the meaning of that. So therefore, of course we can go into a whole discussion on how devotees should associate together because that is the counterpoint, or the, what we say, to, to always look for the good qualities of the Vaishnavas, and then you don't see their faults. Even if you see their faults, it doesn't matter. You can just, when you see a fault, look for a good quality, side by side. And then it says that there are four ways that one can view a situation in terms of a Vaishnava. One is to, when you see a, 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 verse, a, a Vaishnava, immediately you start finding fault. That's the, the most grievous form of deviation. Second is, you see bad qualities, look for good qualities. You see bad qualities and good qualities side by side, focus on the good qualities. Third, Seeing faults as potential good qualities. Yes, they have a fault, but ultimately it's just a covering over their real good quality. That person's very passionate, but still they, they do a lot of service. <laughs> so we might see something that looks like a fault, but actually it's just a covering over a good quality. That's another way to see it. And the highest and most perfect, of course, is this Great souls see like that. They don't see any faults. Even if there are faults, they don't see them. <laughs> now these are the four ways it's mentioned by Bhakti Vinod Thakur also. So. so, if we can avoid offenses, then we can really chant the holy name. <laughs> yeah, because these are the things, offenses are the blockages. There are four kinds of categories of anarthas, because we're talking about anartha nivriti, the stage by which obstacles come in front of the devotee in their practice of Krishna consciousness. These the obstacles may have been characteristics and traits that we've had in previous lives. They may be things we acquired in this life, or they may just be wrong types of thinking. There are four categories of an artist. There is an artist for pious activity. You perform pious activity, you get a chance for, you know, opportunities for material sense gratification. Dharma leads to, to kama and kama leads to, um, dharma leads to artha and artha leads to kama. So kama means enjoyment or material enjoyment. So I perform so many pious activities. Hey, I can go to the heavenly planets and I can live there for a long time and enjoy you know, material life way beyond what's enjoyable here. And it's like that. But that is one of the anarthas, to desire heavenly planets. Another one is that a devotee becomes very powerful 
This process of devotional service is very powerful. And you think, well, now I have some power. And you, can use, you think I can use that power to get what I want. So mystic power, devotees who want mystic power so they can manipulate the material energy. And there are devotees who have that and they use it also. But that's an anartha. That's another type of anartha. Wanting to get mystic power or having mystic power and wanting to use it in a way to enjoy sense gratification. And what's the other one? Liberation. Well, it needs no explanation. And also wanting to enjoy this material world in some way or other. These are the four anarthas based on pious activities. So even though you've accumulated so many good qualities, they can lead to a desire for even better or more, more good qualities, which takes our attention away from the actual goal, which is prema pumarta mahan, love of God, or the process of purifying the heart and coming to the platform of pure devotional service, which is the actual goal of devotional service. The four kinds of impious anarthas are fault-finding, deceit, envy, and pratishta. Fault-finding, envy, deceit, pratishta. Pratishta is the hardest one to get rid of. Pratishta means fame. Material fame. Hey, I'm, you know, I can give good classes, I can sing, everybody tells me I'm such a nice devotee and I'm going, I'm making so much progress. Yeah, and I'm chanting nicely. Wow, yeah, I got it. I'm, 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 up, I'm up there, <laughs> yeah. And the rest of the devotees, they're nice, but they're not as advanced as me. <laughs> you know, and I can see, you know, it's my job to correct them for their own benefit, remember that. So this kind of mentality is another form of anartha. This desire for prestige, family, uh, uh, fame, prestige, position, whatever. Some kind of uh, reciprocation for my success in devotional service. And this, was, this really knocks devotees down. So many devotees have fallen because of this, and especially in our movement. They, they make a lot of advancement, but they fail to take that little anartha out that all of the success that comes around their advancement, because Krishna will reciprocate. He will also make you successful, make you, make you glorifiable. That's his way of appreciating your, uh, but if you take it as something that you deserve or something that you did, then that anartha will grow and it will cause one to become critical of others and also look for gain in material ways also. How much money I have, how many followers I have, how much position I have, hey, I'm advanced. <laughs> That's called Taranga Tarangini, <laughs> Bhakti now, Vishwana Chakravarti Thakur speaks about that in Madhurya Kandambini. Taranga Tarangini, Ranga Tarangini, right? Ranga Tarangini. That one sees their advancement based on what they receive from the material sense based on their devotional service. Their position, followers, wealth, whatever. But these are all gifts of Krishna to be used in devotional service so they can continue to make more and more progress and to preach Krishna consciousness. So um, this is, a, this is as Bhakti Vino, no, I'm sorry, Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati says, this is the difficult one to overcome this pratishta. Very difficult. So how do you avoid that? Stay in the association of devotees. As soon as you get outside and become a little independent and think you don't need the association of devotees anymore, this pratishya can grow automatically and you can't even see it. 
Other people can see it, but you can't. It's so subtle. <laughs> it's very subtle. So if we stay in the association of devotees, the devotees will tell you, hey, you know, you're not so advanced. <laughs> they won't tell you in that way, but they'll let you know <laughs> in different ways. In other words, to keep the association of devotees and to have the mood of service in that association will prevent you from developing this, what is called, partitioner mentality. The idea of being honored. And when we practice Krishna consciousness, we give up the gross forms of material sense gratification. Illicit sex, intoxication, meat eating, gambling, and all of the other activities. But then, there's the subtle aspects of the gross ones. So the subtle aspect of sex desire is profit, adoration, and distinction. And if that's not cut out, that could grow back into the gross forms again, and one can fall down from that point. It's like when you have a weed and it's growing. If you cut the weed on the level of the ground, the root is still there. And in time, the weed will grow back again. So therefore, you have to uproot that weed completely by the process of Harinam Sankirtan and service to the Vaishnavas. This is the way to uproot that weed. Uh, otherwise, it has a tendency and will grow back again. And one will think, wow, I got rid of all of these gross activities, and why am I being attracted by them again, you know? Because of this pratishta. It's very subtle. So, um, and then the fences we mentioned. And so, and then the last category, or we might say, a more simple is philosophical misconceptions. Not knowing one's relationship with Krishna, not knowing one's identity distinct from one's, you know, material identity, one's real identity, not knowing the process of sadhana and prema bhakti, and what's the last one? Mixing in other philosophical deviations into Krishna consciousness and, and seeing them as being aligned with the Siddhanta or the philosophy given. In other words, Mayavadiism. If it comes in, it can come in in a very subtle way. So these are the four categories of an artist. And therefore, one has to work to some degree to uproot them, but stay fixed in the chanting of the Holy Name. And Bhuta Bhavana Prabhu will talk about the third verse later on today. And the third verse is how you can get rid of these anarthas. What is the process? And I won't go into that. I'll let him, I'm sure he's got a way to present his... Uh, how this, these anarthas are destroyed by the practice of the third verse. And you see how this is very successive. The, the benedictions, and then what causes us to get, not to get the benedictions, the, the offenses, the anarthas, and then how to get rid of them. And then once we get rid of them, then how that process starts to move forward, higher and up to the level of prema bhakti. So these eight prayers are really, really, we should learn them, we should read them, we should hear them, we should chant them. And they're very, very, just by chanting them every day, uh, I, I make it a point to chant them before I do my job every day. I just recite them, and then when I'm done, then I begin. But just to chant them is, is very, very, what we say, edifying. It kind of strengthens your consciousness. Now you you can approach the holy name. It's really nice. These eight verses, very powerful. They're spoken by the supreme personality of Godhead. So what more power can you get from that, that this knowledge than 
the words coming from Krishna himself in the form of Lord Chaitanya. It's beautiful. Okay, so one thing I wanted to add that I didn't speak about the first verse, it's nothing really philosophical, but it shows the uh, genius, you might say, of the Supreme Lord. When he describes the seven benedictions, he says, Cheto Dharpana Marjanam. Baba Maha Derva Agni Nirva Panam Shreya Kaiva Vichandrika Vitaranam Vidyavadhu Jeevanam Anandam Bhuri Vardhanam Patipradam Purnam Rita Swardhanam Sarvatma Snapanam Param Vijayate Sri Krishna Sankirtanam Did you catch that? that every one of the benedictions ends with the name Nam. I mean, no, no mortal can do that. <laughs> you know, this is Krishna, Lord Chaitanya. So these, these verses are very, very transcendentally powerful. Just to recite them is just a, a transcendental experience. Okay, thank you. Any questions or?